Wow. A lot of people here. Thank you. Thank you. I was a little worried for a minute that no one would show up. But thank you all so much for being here. And if you need a seat, take whatever empty seat if you need to sit down. First of all, good afternoon. And I want to say welcome to Pier 70 in the Dogpatch neighborhood. Dogpatch is in the house recently voted one of the hippest neighborhoods in the city. I want to start by telling you a story about a famous San Franciscan. Born in 1835, she hailed from Connecticut and was named the Niantic. Yes, it's appropriate we gather at a pier today because the Niantic was a ship, a commercial ship destined for trade with China. Until in 1849, her captain got word that hundreds of migrants were ashore in Panama, looking for transportation to San Francisco, where no doubt their fortune in gold awaited. So the Niantic's crew rebuilt her into a passenger ship. And in May of 1849, she left Panama with nearly 250 pioneers. The Niantic arrived in San Francisco as one of the first ships to bring 49ers ashore. Legend has it newcomers would jump ship before it could even drop anchor in San Francisco Bay. Within a few days, most of the Niantic's crew abandoned her for the gold rush too. So the captain waited for high tide and sailed the Niantic as close to land as they could run, get, running her aground on the shore where Clay and Montgomery Streets now meet. There, the Niantic became a store, offices, and a hotel. Someone cut a door in her side and inscribed, rest for the weary and storage for trunks. Alas, a great fire in 1851 burned much of the Niantic. So enterprising San Franciscans built the Niantic Hotel, once dubbed the finest in the city, with the ship's hull as its foundation. Then it too burned down in 1872. The next incarnation, the stone Niantic building directly atop the old ship and hotel, would not burn. Instead, it was toppled by the earthquake of 1906. Now, surely any rational city would give up at this point, right? No. In fact, you might know where the Niantic rests to this day, right at the foot of the Transamerica building, an iconic part of our skyline where today Chavot is investing a billion dollars in the building and the surrounding area from Connecticut to China to Panama, the gold rush to hospitality offices, from abandonment, fires, and earthquake. The Niantic perseveres. Our downtown perseveres. Our city, San Francisco, will persevere. If our ships if our ship runs aground, we hang a welcome sign and we get back to work. If our hotels burn, we build a bigger one. And if that crumbles, we build a great pyramid. We are San Franciscans. We're not beholden to past catastrophes. We're not victims of circumstances. We are the captains of our own ship. We are the city that knows how. The last few years have been tough, and our challenges ahead even tougher. Public safety concerns, a spiraling fentanyl crisis, 
empty offices, shuttered businesses, and profound learning loss among our children. I know we can overcome these, in part because through four consecutive elections last year, our voters reinstilled every level of government with a mandate to get the basics right, to deliver the basics. to put children before politics, to put results before posturing. And thank you to the voters of this city for electing our new district attorney, Brooke Jenkins. Our district attorney who is combating open-air drug dealing, who is taking on the perpetrators of gun violence, who is prosecuting hate crimes, including against our API communities, and who is sending a strong message that accountability and equity can and indeed must coexist. Thank you for electing Supervisors Matt Dorsey and Joe Lingardio, who, who champion public safety and who, like me, refuse to accept the rampant drug sales or struggling schools. I've been waiting for help like this for a long time. Now let's talk about the work we're going to do. First and foremost, public safety. Last year, we came together to fund new strategies, to recruit and retain police officers, to add new police academy classes, to establish new laws and around destructive practices like vending of stolen goods on our streets, and to allow for common sense tools like access to private security cameras. But our public safety challenges are not going to be solved in just one budget cycle. The gap between how many officers we need and how many we have is vast. We are at least 500 officers short, just as hundreds of more are approaching retirement. This isn't unique to San Francisco. Police staffing is a national problem, but we must solve it locally. To do it, we will expand recruitment strategies and work to retain officers. We will give them the resources they need. Yes, we must hold officers accountable, but we must also respect the hard work they do every day and respect them. We can also support and ease their work with complementary alternatives to police interventions. That means ambassadors in the Tenderloin, downtown, and our transit stations across all of our neighborhoods who provide that positive presence on the streets. It means our street crisis response teams are out 24-7 responding to people who are in crisis. Our residents are demanding that we build a safe city, that we build back our police force, and we need to deliver for them. The push for full staffing has to be consistent and it has to be sustained. But full staffing is still years away. Right now, our officers are, our officers are working overtime to meet the basic needs of our city. And in order to do that, we're going to have to make some hard decisions. So I will be introducing a $25 million budget supplemental to fund overtime and to keep our officers walking the beats, making drug arrests, and dealing with We need to keep our officers walking the beats, making drug arrests, and addressing retail theft. And I want to make one thing very clear, I am not okay with open-air drug dealing in this city, period.
The families who are losing people to fentanyl are certainly not okay with it. And the people who work and live in the Tenderloin every single day, they're not okay with it. Yes, yes, we are pushing for innovative programs to get people into care and to treatment, including working on overdose prevention programs. But we need to enforce the law. Likewise, home and business break-ins require a timely police response, an investigation, an arrest. And all of this requires having officers. And those officers need clear support from the leadership of this city. Because public safety isn't only about taking care of our residents, it's also about taking care of our economy. Over the last year, I visited businesses to meet not just with CEOs, but with workers. These are the people who ride BART and Muni every single day, who go to our bars and our restaurants, and who we need to bring downtown back to life. Their number one concern that I've heard over and over, office after office, public safety. And we have to listen. But even as we do, we must accept another tough fact. San Francisco downtown, as we know it, is not coming back. And you know what? That's OK. Empty office buildings have fueled dire predictions about economic doom and screaming headlines about the death of downtown. But let's keep some perspective here. In 1907, downtown was mostly rubble and ash. That's considerably worse than today's shift in how people are working. We have our challenges, but that doesn't mean it's the end of downtown. Like the Niantic, it's a call to action, to reimagine what our future holds, what we can be, to think about what kind of city we are and what kind of city we can be. The truth is, it won't be one thing that fixes downtown. It will be many things. And the good news is that downtown San Francisco has so many advantages. A beautiful waterfront location, local and regional transportation, a dense walkable neighborhood, restaurants, bars, entertainment, and the proximity to iconic venues like Oracle, Park, and Chase Center. And most importantly, we have unparalleled talent, a culture where it's common to dream of the gr next great idea that will change the world. Behind me is Astronis, a company that is building satellite technology that brings high-speed internet access across the world. Millions of people can benefit from what is being built and designed right here. When asked why, when asked why Astronus is located in San Francisco, their CEO, John Gredmark, pointed to the talent, the people, the densest collection of engineering talent anywhere. Anywhere. Pier 70 has a rich history of fostering the future. The ironworks that drove shipbuilding through our city's early history and two world wars. The BART tunnels were built right here. And now a satellite tech company is here building the future? That's pretty amazing. As people think about the changing nature of the workplace, we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to recruit new business sectors and companies and to create a more diverse and resilient local economy. 
whether that's in finance or healthcare or green tech, biotech, or in driverless vehicles, which are out testing our rising hills and narrow streets, or in artificial intelligence, a groundbreaking industry that is just tapping into a new vision of what's possible and growing right here in San Francisco. They're talking about it across the world. It's growing in our city. Our airport was just named the best in the country. You see, this city, it is ready to foster a spirit of success. And for the past several months, I've met with business leaders, small businesses and workers to seek and share ideas. And today, we are releasing my plan a roadmap for the future of downtown. It calls for reforming our tax structure to make San Francisco more competitive right now. We can't wait till next year right now. I'm proposing legislation to protect our existing companies by pausing tax increases on our retail businesses, our hotels, manufacturing sectors, and arts and entertainment. And to attract new businesses, we will be offering tax breaks for three years for any company that wants to start business in San Francisco. We will work on tax reform legislation for next year's ballot by collaborating with our controller, the Board of Supervisors, the business community, and labor. Because taxes require serious thought and planning, and we have to stop the endless cycle of one-off ballot measures around taxes thrown on the ballot without any real thought or any analysis. We're feeling the impacts when businesses pack up and leave our city because of it. We will prioritize arts and entertainment downtown to bring the streets alive. <laughs> Through rezoning efforts and investments and a new arts, culture, and entertainment district, we will dedicate we will dedicate cleaning crews and ambassadors to work alongside our public safety officers. We will make it easier to open and operate small businesses downtown through improving our permitting process. We will hire more transit operators who we desperately need to bring Muni service back all over this city. And of course, to recruit police officers and muni operators to create a more resilient, thriving local economy, we need homes that working people can actually afford. The approval of our housing element, a plan for what we need to build over the next eight years, was a major first step. But it was only a first step. To build the 82,000 homes the plan calls for, we need to approve and build homes three times faster than we did over the last decade. And that's in a market right now where builders are struggling to make projects financially feasible. My plan, housing for all, is how we make this happen. And it's built on a simple premise. We need to remove the barriers to build new housing, period. That's it. <laughs> That's it. 
The plan starts with my executive directive setting out what our departments need to do. We will remove all barriers to all new housing, open up the housing pipeline, untangle city processes and get departments delivering results faster, cut fees and other costs, identify the funding for affordable housing to meet our goals, and rezone areas all across the city in all neighborhoods. All neighborhoods have to be a part of the future of this city. And we've actually created much of the housing we need on paper. In addition to the 18,000 homes we built since 2018, we have more than 52,000 units that have been approved. Can you imagine that? But for various reasons, they simply aren't being built. To open this pipeline, I will introduce legislation to build the public infrastructure of our largest projects faster. What does that mean? We will get the roads, the pipes, the power lines built quickly so that housing construction can start. The Portrayal Power Station, just down the road from here, is already on board and ready to go. You see, this project alone has 2,000 new homes stuck in the pipeline and would create over 1,000 union jobs. This one project, with our legislation, we can break ground on new workforce housing this year. This one policy could help unlock tens of thousands of homes, including nearly 13,000 affordable homes. Housing for all is a promise. A promise that the next generation of San Franciscans will be able to afford to live here. That our families will have homes to raise their children. That our workers can live near their jobs and not be forced to long commutes that choke our roads and pollute our air. You cannot support families workers, the environment, without supporting infill housing. You cannot say you want to address homelessness without building homes. And yet so many of the critics who claim homelessness is all about and only about a lack of housing are the same critics who block pro-housing policies time and time again. Time and time again. Not anymore. We must build and we must build now. And speaking of housing the homeless, look at what we were able to do the last few years. San Francisco was the only county in the Bay Area to reduce homelessness over the last three years, a 15% reduction in unsheltered persons on the street. Over the last year, we placed 2,400 households into permanent supportive housing, 7,000 into shelter, nearly 10,000 households have received rental assistance and other support so they wouldn't end up on the streets. I know homelessness can be frustrating and seem unsolvable, but remember, this is a national crisis impacting every city, large and small, up and down the West Coast. We are, in this city, treating it like a crisis and making progress. This year, we will launch our new five-year strategic plan on homelessness. It will set clear goals for our departments and nonprofit partners, which we will demand that they meet. We will work to 
complete our plan to add new mental health beds, and we will work with the state to add even more. We will push forward our overdose prevention plan, working with supervisors Dorsey and Ronan to continue bringing overdose deaths down in our city. Working with Supervisor Mandelman, we're finally starting to see some success in the Castro reaching people who refused service for years. That targeted, coordinated, consistent approach is working, and we need to expand it to other neighborhoods. We will also continue to fight for reforms to California's mental health laws. Our reforms have been defeated again and again in the state legislature, despite the heroic efforts of, senators, of leaders like Senators Scott Weiner and Susan Eggman. But we won't give up. We are bringing reforms to our conservatorship laws back this year, because our opponents won't be able to overcome the glare of public scrutiny forever. Californians simply won't be willing to let people continue to suffer and die on our streets because we can't get it together. This year, we will also continue to better serve San Francisco's families through our Children and Family Recovery Plan, providing vouchers and subsidies for early education paying early educators more, developing a pipeline to recruit and train more educators, offering summer learning opportunities, academic support to combat the learning loss, mental health support, and paid internships for our kids. And we will build on what has been a historic era a renaissance for our parks and open space. And I see a number of our local 261 gardeners and folks who take care of the parks here today. Thank you. The renaissance is because of the hands of the people that take care of these parks every day. In 2022, we opened Tunnel Tops, Battery Bluff, Francisco Park with a breathtaking views that are absolutely unmatched anywhere in the world. The great highways, slow streets, and shared spaces transitioned from temporary pandemic responses to key elements of our city's dedication to safe and open spaces. And we made JFK Promenade a permanent park space for all San Franciscans. We'll continue these historic investments in our parks, like India Basin, which will transform our southern waterfront and the Bayview Hunters Point for decades to come. San Francisco will keep implementing our climate action plan aggressively, expanding EV infrastructure and electrifying our buildings, marching towards our goal of being greenhouse gas free by 2040, five years ahead of the state's goal. We will continue to lead on innovative equity programs like Dreamkeeper Initiative. <laughs> The Dream, the Dream Keeper Initiative, which just doesn't talk about what we're going to do for the black community. It does what we need to do for the black community. And Opportunities for All, which has already made dramatic positive change in people's lives. We will continue uplifting and defending trans people in the face of unspeakable bigotry around the country. We will 
do all this while continuing to reform how our government functions. We started with slashing the time it takes to hire new city employees. That means getting our mechanics, street cleaners, nurses, bus drivers, and gardeners, our union workers, on the job sooner so that they can take care of this city. <laughs> Supervisor Stephanie is leading the efforts to bring accountability to our contracting, and she has my full partnership and support. And we will make and we will make the hard choices facing us with our budget. I know working with the Board of Supervisors under President Aaron Peskin and Budget Chair Connie Chan, we will achieve our goals while closing our $720 million budget deficit. We're going to do it, Felicia. We won't solve all of San Francisco's problems in a year. And we can't fear trying new things. Because if we stand still, we fall behind. When we push forward, even if we stumble, we stumble forward. There is a whole ecosystem of naysayers counting San Francisco out. Of course, we heard it all before. Earthquakes destroy a city. Summer of love becomes winter of discontent. Earthquake destroys city again. Tech bubble burst San Francisco. I want to say something to the media talking heads, the critics, to the men who point out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done it better. As Maya Angelou said, you may shoot me with your words, but still like air I rise. So you can write us off, but you better write in pencil because we have proved you wrong every time before, and soon we will again. It's what we do. We endure. We adapt. We lead. In this city, anything is possible. We turn ships into hotels and offices, power plants into housing and new neighborhoods. We build satellites that sweep across the sky, and we create a world where young girls from the projects could be mayor. I am, I am committed to you. I'm committed to this city. And I am, spy, I am inspired by the knowledge that together we will do what have always been done. We will rise, we will stumble, and we will rise again with our voice in unison, our eyes to the future. We will show the world that this is San Francisco, and we will never, ever give up. Thank you. Thank you.